Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Uh, let's start with this wonderful one, all creatures of our God and King. Please stand if you are able. Holy God, we worship and adore you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today in our worship, we long for a glimpse of your glory, seen perfectly in Christ our Lord. As we worship, may we gain new insight about the mystery and wonder of your love. And may we sense new ways to mirror that love in our world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to everyone worshipping with us this morning, whether you're worshipping here in the chapel or worshipping at home. So firstly, um, some sad news. If you can keep Mark Bobletter and his family in your prayers, Mark's mother, Joan, passed away last night. So as I say, please keep them in your prayers. 
school holidays at the end of this week, so that means that for the next three Friday nights, um, our Saviour congregation will be responsible for the Helping Hands van. So if you'd be interested to come along um, and try the new Helping Hands van, if you haven't been out with that van before, or just interested to see what happens on a Friday night, then please see Steve Powell after the service. He'll be up the back. And Steve also mentions that if anyone has any excess fresh produce, so if you have a bumper crop of onions or something, if you'd like to drop that fresh produce into the kitchen on Thursday or Friday and just mark it helping hands, then um, the people on the helping hands run are quite appreciative of that sort of stuff. After service today, we'll be changing the banners from red to green, and luckily they stay green for about the next five months, so it'll be the last change for a while. And I invite Robin Stiller to come up and give us a couple of messages. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> You're scary. My name is Robin Stiller, and just recently I joined Russell and Fletcher on the finance team. They were a well-oiled bicycle, but now I think they've become a, a tricycle with a wonky wheel. <laughs> Being up here is certainly not my comfort zone, so please bear with me. I'm here this morning to encourage you to give to our annual hub appeal. Our hub is a very relaxed and welcoming place. We are, hallelujah, we're now using it on Sunday mornings to enjoy our morning tea. Just on Tuesday, we used the, the hub after Michael Clyden's installation as head of Redeemer College. And most importantly to me, it is where one of my grandsons sits with his mates during his lunch breaks. It's a useful area for many groups and I encourage you all to enjoy our hub. At this point, I would really like to thank the, the people who had the courage and foresight to undertake the making of the hub possible. Well done, thank you. I will iterate some details for you. We need to raise $40,000 for our loan repayment, which falls due at the end of this month. Um, all donations are tax deductible, so now is the opportune time to give. Um, th these, are, uh, these and more details can be found in the weekly bulletin email, um, the Our Saviour Facebook page, and under Community, on the Redeemer College website. This is where I have to say that in, there's no way I could stand up here and ask you to give if I haven't done so myself. On Wednesday morning, I couldn't find the email details and I don't do Facebook. So I went to the, to the Redeemer College website and under community, I found the details I needed. I also found that they do credit card and EFT choices there, which was really good for me. Okay, if you need any assistance or have a question, please feel free to see any of the finance team members. Maybe Russell or Fletcher would be the better choice though. <sighs> um, or you could email office at, our, say, at oslc .org .au and somebody smart there will answer your question. It won't be me. <laughs> Please forgive me, but if I have to get up here and, and if I have to be up here, I'm going to address some issues that are close to my heart. Good morning, my name is Rosta Robin, and I'm happily organising all those wonderful people who get in and do things to make our church life run a bit more smoothly. Unless, of course, I have stuffed something up. Anyway. My thanks to each and everyone who contributes in either a big or a little way. 
it is truly appreciated. At the end of last year, our Saviour lost, sadly lost, quite a few people, families that were active on our roster duties. I would really like each of you to consider how you could help fill our roster in some way. Prayer, lecture, communion prep, greeting, stewards, audio, PowerPoint, camera, and of course, morning tea roster. My desire is that we end up having an abundance of willing servants who want to help and that I have no, ro no slots left on my roster, okay? Can I tell you that I really hate wearing hats? Good morning, my name is not Robin Kleinschmidt, I'm the other Robin from Folak. Folak is short for Friends of Lutheran Archives Queensland, and our aim is to have a couple of presentations each year on areas of interest in the Lutheran Church. My hat's falling. Last month, we had a presentation from Philip Holsnecht. Philip is, a, is in the... Th Philip is the third generation of a missionary family in New Guinea, and I thought he was very interesting to listen to. But then I do live with Colin, so... So, I am, I am here letting you know that we are doing another presentation on Saturday, the 29th of October at Coolum. So, this is just a date claimer and there will be more details to come. And here ends this morning's sermon. Thank you. It's eight. There we go. Morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. It's great to be back in nice and warm Brisbane um, after spending last weekend up in uh, Toowoomba for Synod. Synod was in a uh, really... Uh, quite a fantastic time for our church. There was a number of very significant decisions that we made uh, as a gathering of the Lutheran Church in Queensland. Um, and more information about all of those decisions and the ongoing impact of what that means for the way that our district is structured will continue to filter through um, in the, re the real terms what it means for you as a as a member of our saviour and the relationship to the district, I don't think there'll be significant impact. However, it's really important that we made all of those decisions to help continue to support us. I really enjoyed Robin calling herself Roster Robin this morning because when I first shifted here and Carl and Joe in the office would talk about Robin, I'd have to stop and go, now which one? Is it Pastor Robin? Choir Robin, or is it Roster Robin? Um, they were the, the three designations, and I'm, I quite enjoy that I can now distinguish between all three. Although this Friends of Lutheran Archives thing with having two Robins on, I don't know, that's going to get me every time. This morning as we're gathering, we're going to uh, consider how we learn to discern and hear God speaking to us. So as we go through our service this morning, listen for God's quiet voice speaking to you, sharing the message that you need to hear. So let's begin our worship in God's name will speak the invocation responsively. I'm in yellow, you're in white. O oh God who created us in love. O oh Jesus Christ who redeemed this world in love. O Holy Spirit, who moves this world towards its God-appointed end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let's draw near to God our Father with a true heart to confess our sins. 
and ask him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. We pray together from the screen. Triune God, we praise you as the God of love and life. Through Jesus prayed that we would be one. We confess that we fail to live in unity with each other and with you. We long for your spirit to heal us and empower us. We long for you to help us experience communion with you and with each other as we gather around your word and table. Even now, dependent on your grace, we commit ourselves to live more fully in the unity you desire. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When you cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And if, ch if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In Christ, by the power of the Spirit, you are forgiven. As forgiven children of God, we'll hear God speaking to us through our Bible readings. Our first reading comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 15. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, travelling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head with some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel forty days and forty nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
and after the fire there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. And our response, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the good news as recorded in Luke chapter 8 verses 26 to 39. We are people who live in this good news, so as you are able, please stand for the gospel. The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. So they arrived in the region of the Genesenes across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of a boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. This spirit had often taken control of the man, even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone, for a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him home, saying, No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all through the town, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. And our response, this is the word of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for bringing peace, hope and healing to our world. Fill us with the joy of your continual presence. 
Amen. I wonder if we have any children or any childlike person who'd like to come and sit up here with me while I talk about children's address today. So, kids, come on down. Oh, we're a bit slow today. Are we cold? Oh, okay. Yes, it was cold when I got up this morning too. Come close so we get warm. Here they come. I'm going to talk about tantrums. Do you know what a tantrum is? Tell me what a tantrum is. Oh, wow, spot on, Vaughan. It's when somebody cries and acts out when they don't get what they want. Now, I'm going to put my hand up and say I throw a tantrum at least once a week. And they're not pretty. I scream and I yell and I stamp my feet. Sometimes I throw things. Don't tell anybody else, will you? You? Do you have tantrums too? No? Oh. Tantrums are not real good. They're not pretty, are they? No. And they really don't get you what to want. But today we read in a story about a man who threw a pretty good tantrum. And everybody in the town was so frightened of him that they wouldn't go near him. In fact, he couldn't even live in the town. He had to live in caves out in the mountains because nobody wanted him anywhere near them. So that's a good thing, probably not to throw tantrums because people don't like being around cranky people, hey? So what do you think about that story today? Why do you think Jesus told us that story? Not to throw tantrums? Yes, for. So we should also throw tantrums if we get what we want. That's right. There's other ways of doing things, isn't it? Tantrums really don't get us what we want. Jumping up and down, yelling, screaming, stamping our feet doesn't really get us what us want. Sometimes mums and dads may say, go to your room until you can come out and speak nicely. Now, Ross doesn't say that to me, but I'm sure he would like to at times. He would like to say, just carry it, go outside until you're ready to come back inside and speak nicely. <sighs> and so I do. I take a deep breath and I think, okay, that wasn't very helpful. That didn't solve any problems. I'll just better get on. And I, I apologise to Ross. I'm very sorry, Ross, when I throw tantrums. So that's what the story's about today. Tantrums aren't that good. This man had the whole town was frightened of him. So frightened that he couldn't even live in the town with them. He had to live away. But do you know, he was amazed when Jesus actually came walking towards him. Because he thought, no one else likes me. Why is this man walking towards me? Why do you think Jesus walked towards this cranky man? Yes, go on. Oh, you're just stretching. Okay. I, I was in the zone. I thought we were having this thing. Anybody know why Jesus went to talk to this man? I think Jesus already knew that he could help this man. And he already knew, I think, that this man was going to ask Jesus for help. How do we normally ask Jesus for help? Do we say it? That's exactly why right. we have a prayer. When we talk to God, it's got a special name and it's called praying. And a lot of times we pray just before we go to bed or maybe we pray before we go to school in the morning or if, like me, you pray just before you're going to get into trouble. So praying is good. I like to pray to Jesus because he listens to me and... He always does the best thing by me, even though I may not like what Jesus has for me to do. It's always the best for him and for the world and for God and everybody in us. So let's say a prayer together this morning. I was thinking 
Maybe if we could do an echo prayer. Anybody know what an echo prayer is? Yeah, yeah. Spot on. It's exactly that. I say the one sentence and you say the second sentence. So you're actually an echo for what I say. Yep. Okay, an echo. Okay, let's assume a prayer position. Heavenly Father. We come to you today because we know you listen to us. Lord, we have lots of issues and we'd like you to take care of them, please. We have faith in you and we know that you will do this for us. And we will share your love with other people. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you very much. You can go back and sit down now. be seated. God's grace is yours through Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour. Amen. This morning we're going to focus on our reading from 1 Kings, uh, the story about Elijah and hearing God's voice. Uh, And I wonder for how many of you remember much about the story of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Maybe you get him a little bit confused with Elisha, his successor, um, and the fact that these two were around at the same time, and they did a whole heap of similar things as well. Elijah was called to be a prophet for God, to speak God's word, specifically to the king and the queen of Israel. He would go and he would share God's good news. He would call the king and the queen back into line when things went wrong. 
Now, in this instance, in our story this morning, Ahab, he's the one who is king. He is the Israelite. He's married Jezebel, who is not an Israelite, who has brought all of these foreign gods in, breaking that covenant relationship with God. And Jezebel, well, maybe you've heard that phrase referred to other people as well. She was wicked. She was not good. Not good for Ahab, not good for Israel. And so Elijah was called by God to consistently go and give messages to Ahab, to Jezebel, to say, enough is enough, things have to change, those foreign gods need to go, there's only the one true God. Come back and God will forgive you. It got so bad that God sent Elijah to Ahab and Jezebel and told Elijah to give this message. If you don't change your ways, then there's going to be a drought for three years. And that's exactly what happened. Now, nearing the end of that third year, uh, Elijah, being the only prophet of God left, uh, set this showdown up on Mount Carmel uh, with the prophets of Baal. There was a whole host of them, more than 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah said, look, what we're going to do is we'll build two altars, one one on the left, one on the right. Uh, Then we'll put our sacrifice on top, but we won't light it. We'll call down fire from heaven. So if Baal is the true God, then he will light the fire and... That will prove that that's the God we should follow. But if God is God, if Yahweh is God, then he will light the fire and that is the one that we should follow. Pretty gutsy, pretty bold move. 1v450 odd. It's not the odds that usually we would take, is it? And so after this big showdown had started, everything was set. Elijah just sat back and watched for a while while the prophets of Baal tried to call down fire from their God. And it gets to it, and I can kind of imagine Elijah sitting uh, on, a, on a deck chair, kind of looking at his watch going, hey guys, it's really not happening for you. Maybe your God's gone on holidays. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's on the toilet. Like he's starting to really sling off at them. And really stir them up. And and these poor prophets of Baal are just, they're literally flogging themselves trying to do this. And eventually Elijah gets up from his deck chair and says, that's enough, guys. Like, seriously, don't put yourself through any more. And Elijah says, can you just dump a whole heap of water on my altar? Yeah, no, a bit more. A bit more water. Make sure everything's completely soaked. So wet that you can't think that this is spontaneous combustion. There was puddles around the altar and Elijah kneels down and says, God, show your stuff. And he did. And Elijah then says, see, proved it. God is king. God is the one who's in control. All these prophets of Baal are just liars and false prophets. And the people decide that they're not going to follow Baal anymore. And there's this rebellion of a kind. But it doesn't last very long. Jezebel was very deeply offended. And this is where our reading picks up. Because she says, sends this message to Elijah saying, you know, if you keep this up, I'm going to kill you. In fact, if you're not dead by this time tomorrow, I'll kill myself. Because I'm so sure that you should die. So here, Elijah, the man who's promised that there would be a famine, that there would be drought, that no rain would fall, that he could stand up to 450 prophets of Baal and have such deep confidence in God, hears this message and turns on his heels and runs. It's not what we would have expected from this man. After all, He'd just done all of these crazy, amazing, powerful words and things from God. And yet he turns on his heels and runs and goes for a nap. Have you ever felt like that? 
Like you've just had to work so hard that the only thing you can do is just have a little kip. And an angel comes to Elijah and touches him on the shoulder and says, you need to have something to eat, buddy. And so he does, and he goes back to sleep. Must have been a good meal. So full up that he fell back asleep after it. And the angel comes again and says, you still need more food. And so Elijah eats. And he goes off to Mount Sinai. Now, that should be a familiar place. Ten Commandments. The presence of God. This place is a holy place where the people of Israel have connected with Yahweh before. And so Elijah's there, but he's not in this high mood of everything is going great. This is amazing. We've just made it out of slavery from Egypt, like the people of Israel. When they gathered at Mount Sinai, he seems down, low. In fact, he goes and finds a a cave and he is really out of it. And God comes and speaks to him. And so Elijah, with all of this previous experience of hearing God, he's feeling low, he's feeling out of it, he's feeling isolated, lonely. Some people even say that he was possibly depressed. Here in this moment, what he really needs is God's voice. He needs to hear God speak to him. And the first message that God asks is, what are you doing here? That's not something that I think of as reassuring, comforting. What are you here for? And Elijah unloads, he says, I'm the only one left. I'm grumpy. I don't like it. God says, well, I'll speak to you. I'll reassure you that I am with you. And so all of a sudden there's this massive wind. But we hear in that that God's not in the wind. So Elijah, as he's listening for God, expecting to hear God's voice, hears the wind, but nothing from God. Then there's the earthquake. Now remember, he's in a cave. I would bet that a cave is not a great place to be when there is an earthquake. Having spent some time in New Zealand um, as a pastor, where earthquakes were fairly commonplace, uh, underground is not one place I would like to be. But God's not in that either. Then there's this fire. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from God. Where does it go? Who knows? God's not in that either. And it's interesting that God's not in these three things because typically these three things are signs of God's presence, signs of God's power. You know, it's often referred to in terms of the prophets, they talk about God reaffirming that he is a God who shows up in powerful ways, wind, earthquake, fire, these are all pictures of who God is in terms of his power, his might, his presence, and especially in the prophets also, his divine judgment. But God's not in these three things. There's no show of power, there's no show of might, and probably most importantly here, there's no show of judgment. And then after that, there's this still, small whisper. And Elijah recognises the voice immediately. God is here. God is with me. And so God asks him that same question once again. Why are you here, mate? And Elijah responds... Word for word, exactly the same. Does God listen to Elijah's whinge? Oh, you bet. Does he let Elijah get his own way? Kind of, sort of, but not really. Elijah's whinge is, I'm the only one left. It's not fair. It's not fair. You guys 
God, you should act in Israel. There should be this mass repentance and return to you. And, and it's all on my shoulders. It's not fair. And God hears that and says, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I want you to go back. So there's no continued isolation for Elijah. And God gives him some instructions. We get the first one here in our reading. We heard it. Anoint this person king of this place. And then that happens a couple more times. Go to this place, anoint that person as king. Anoint the next person as king. And anoint Elisha as your successor. So God kind of listens to what Elijah has to say around Elijah's desire to, I'm out. But he doesn't also really because he says there's still more work to do. But now there's not one, there's two. And Elijah and Elisha work together to continue to call people of Israel back to God. Ultimately, God does hear Elisha, Elijah, sorry, wrong one, Elijah, and he takes him up in the fiery chariot. You remember that story from your kid's Bible? Elijah is one of the three people in the Bible who goes straight up into God's presence. Enoch in Genesis, Moses at the end of Deuteronomy, and now Elijah. Fiery chariot goes up into God's presence. And Elisha carries on the work. So how do we hear God's voice? I don't know about you, but I don't hear God speaking to me like what we hear in the prophets. You know, there's no voice of God that says, excuse me, what are you doing here? There's no voice that says, go and do this. I haven't been asked to anoint anybody as king. I don't know about you. There's not a way where I would say that I have heard God's loud voice speaking to me aloud. And yet I have heard God speak. God continues to speak to me. So how do we hear God's voice? How do we understand that we know that it's God who's speaking and it's not just what I'd want to do? It's not just some microphone cutting in and out. Do you want me to go here? Yeah. Life, make life a bit easier for those of us online. Uh, sorry about the cut in and out. Don't know what's going on. How do we know and hear God's voice in the midst of the chaos and the noise of this world? I think this story and the whole Bible helps us to understand how we hear God speaking to us. And like there's plenty of ways where we can go and see and hear God at work. I'm not going to cover those this morning, otherwise we'd be here for far too long. But how do we discern that voice that we think we hear, whether it's an out loud one or something of a sense inside of ourselves, how do we discern that to be God and not just a good idea of our own. And the first question I often ask myself is, does this align with what I know of God? Does it fit with the picture of God that I have? Does it align with the God of love that the Bible teaches me? Does it align with something that I have heard time and time again God speaking to me? Does it fit with that message? If so, then maybe it's God speaking. If not, then it's probably me. If I have a sense that there's some fire and brimstone that needs to come, sometimes that's a big temptation as a preacher, got to be honest. And then I sit and read the stories and I reflect and I think, is this what God wants to say? And too often the answer is no. And I get grumpy in myself. 
but actually it's about discerning that actually the message that God has for our world isn't the judgment and the hate and the, the fire, the brimstone, but actually it's a message of love. So if it aligns with what I know of God, does it also align with what I read in the Bible? Does it fit with the overall message of the Bible? Does it fit with what I've heard and learned from the Bible over my years? If yes, then maybe it's God speaking once again. If no, then it needs some more testing. And then finally, does it align with what others are hearing God say as well? In my time as pastor, I've had a number of different people walk up to me and say, now, pastor, I've heard God say we should do, insert thing here. My response often to that is, okay, let's test that. Who else is hearing that same message? And so I wonder what God is trying to say to us here at Our Saviour. What is the thing he's calling us to do? Who is it he calling us to be? How can we hear and discern God's call into action? Maybe you've heard something. I encourage you to test that with others around you to see if they're hearing the same thing as well. Because if it's what God is calling us into, then God will not just be speaking it to one of us, but all of us. And that vision will be caught by all. Three simple little things that can help us to learn how to hear and discern if God is speaking to us. So that we can continue to be followers of Jesus. Because we know... 100%, God continues to speak to us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God is living and active in our world and speaking to us all the time. As we grow in our faith, I encourage you to continue to learn how to to discern, to understand what God is calling you to. Amen. We're going to continue as we sing our next song. And as we sing, your offerings for God's work will be collected. Of the 
pray together. Thank you, Lord, for calling us and giving us so many gifts, both physical and spiritual. Help us to go out and serve you by showing your compassion and love to others. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, and having given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So our instructions for communion today. Firstly, I invite our helpers, our deacons and stewards to come forward to prepare communion. And I'd also invite the band to come forward to receive communion first. While they're coming forward, you might like to pass the peace with those around you with a nod or a wave or a smile. At our Saviour, all are welcome to come and receive communion if you believe that in this meal you receive the body and blood of Jesus. So communion will run similarly till it has been the past few months. So have two communion stations at the front. The stewards will direct you to come forward row by row from the side aisles to receive bread and individual cups of wine. Please wait for their directions. As you return to your seats via the centre aisle, there'll be some small bins for your empty cups. Gluten-free wafers are available on request. Please ask the deacons if you prefer those. All the wine is wine without alcohol. Our children's ministries are running today, so as soon as families are ready, you're welcome to come forward. Jesus invites us to this meal. Jesus says... When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. All is ready. All are welcome. Please come.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood. Strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life eternal. Go in God's peace. Amen. Let's spend some time in prayer. Lord God, we pray that and give you thanks that you have safely guided us through this week so that we have been able to join again today in worship. We pray for the world, that governments will rule justly so that peace and freedom will be the right of all, that you will protect the peoples of the nations where there are wars and civil unrest, that there will be rain in season so that all may be fed, that your hand will protect those who are beset by natural disasters. We pray for our nation, for the federal parliament and for the parliaments of each state, and especially our own state, that those who have been elected will have hearts to serve and will do so in justice and fairness to all. We pray for the wider church, for the persecuted who bear your name in spite of the regimes where they live, Give them courage and hope to know that they are not forgotten and that your spirit remains with them. For the Lutheran Church of Australia and New Zealand and all its pastors and church workers, that will, it will abide in you and always seek your will and strength to move forward. We pray for our congregation and give you thanks for our pastor, our staff, and all those who work and volunteer to keep your light shining amongst us. Encourage many more to volunteer and to give freely of their time and talents. We pray for the Governance Council and their deliberations on our behalf, that above all, they listen for your voice, so that our plans are aligned with your will for us in this place for the ministries to children and young people so that the seeds of your word may be nourished and planted. We pay for the Christian Life Week camps and winter kids camps to be held in these school holidays. May they enrich the lives of all who attend and strengthen their faith in you. We pray for all the schools in our community and especially for Redeemer College that staff and students will enjoy a healthy and safe break from their studies and work, that you, Lord, above all, and your voice will be the guide for all, governing councils, teachers, support staff, students and their parents. We pray for those in need. You alone know the deep longings and needs of all. Comfort those who mourn. Give courage and peace to those who struggle with serious health issues. Give perseverance to those who wait for new employment and keep all travellers safe. For the message we have heard today, 
Open the eyes of our hearts so that we may know the depth of the hope to which you call us. Let your word not fall on fertile ground, but make us all hungry to read your word. And send your spirit to encourage us to meet together with joy and worship each week. As we go from this place, walk with us, guide and protect us all into the coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God goes with us out into our daily life. God continues to empower us by his Holy Spirit at work in us. And so receive God's blessing to carry with you so that you can be blessing bearers to the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. Let's stand for our final song. Thank you.